Take it away. Wonderful. Uh, so, as mentioned, uh, the idea behind this talk is to discuss uh, the data that we have on these cards that have just kind of quietly crept into our lives over the past few years. Uh, but before I start, I should probably introduce myself. So I'm currently working in London uh, for a mobile payment startup uh, called Judo Payments. Uh, during most of the year, I am a student at Aberdeen University up in the lovely Dundee, Scotland. Uh, and this year I'll be serving as the secretary for the Ethical Hacking Society and will be organizing next year's Securite. Uh, prior to moving to Scotland, I lived in the Dominican Republic for 13 years uh, and grew up there. And the things that I'm interested in are payments technologies, uh, the idea of security uh, versus user experience, uh, embedded devices, and public transportation ticketing. So if you look at the common use cases for smart cards, uh, they're often used as replacements for magnetic stripe cards. And the reason for this is that with magnetic stripe cards, anybody can read or write to the cards. And additionally, they tend to not be very durable. Uh, they might lose their encoding, uh, and you have to replace them uh, more often. So as a result, smart cards very quickly grew in popularity because you could more or less trust the data that was held on them and hold them to a certain degree of security. Uh, if you take a look at your wallet, you may find a handful of these cards in it. Uh, you probably have a bank card, maybe you have a transit card, uh, you might have a student card or an office key that may also have smart cards in them. And if you take a look at your appliances, you might have a decoder card in a satellite box, uh, you have a SIM card in your cell phone, and you may use a smart card to top up uh, your electricity at home. So basically, we are absolutely surrounded by smart cards in 2016. But we perhaps haven't stopped to consider the implications, uh, the security implications that we have with these devices. And potentially, we haven't considered what data is held on these cards. Now, in contrast to magnetic stripe cards, where you directly interact with the data on the card, uh, so, for example, this is a magnetic stripe card uh, being exposed to iron oxide and showing the ones and zeros as gaps uh, in the metal. It's quite impractical to directly interact with the storage on a smart card. Uh, effectively, you have to subject it to acid um, in order to analyze silicon, and chances are you're going to damage the smart card in the process of doing so. Um, so the chances of you being able to interact with it after inspecting the smart card uh, is quite unlikely. Uh, additionally, if you sort of think about it, there's no real data on the smart card that you can clone. Um, because when you speak with a smart card, you're not necessarily interested in the data itself on the smart card. Uh, but rather, you're interested in the smart card's responses to a handful of commands. Um, because you're not directly interacting with the data as it's stored on the smart card, uh, the smart card, for example, might be doing some pre-processing on it um, in order to give it to you in a nicer format. So with this in mind, you do have to speak with a smart card in order to inspect its contents and you have to play by the smart card's rules, and you have to use the interfaces that it exposes. Uh, and commonly to do this, you'll use one of two interfaces. Uh, you'll more commonly use a contact interface, uh, so one of the various pinouts shown on the left here, or you could use uh, NFC or contactless uh, in order to interact with the smart card. So if you're speaking with a smart card over a contact interface, uh, that's defined by the ISO specification 7816, uh, whereas contactless cards are defined by 14443, uh, which uses 70, uh, 7816's uh, T1 protocol. Um, so it's effectively the same thing, uh, just that you might have more interference if you have multiple cards uh, in the field. Um, now, the cool thing about this is that because they use the same protocols 
uh, just over different uh, communication fields, you can share silicon across uh, both interfaces. So here's an example of a bank card where you can see that the wires for the contactless interface are going into the same chip that is used for the actual uh, contact interface. And effectively, smart cards are varyingly clever ASICs. Uh, you have you know, a, an application-specific uh, controller on these cards uh, that depending on, on, on how clever the manufacturer decided uh, they wanted the card to be can do a variety of different things. Uh, many of these smart cards will run Java card, uh, which is a heavily stripped down uh, Java virtual machine. It doesn't have things like strings, uh, and instead you have to use byte arrays for most things, um, you know, which is reasonable when you consider how small and, and how limited uh, these chips are. Um, and this is the type of, you'll, you'll have Java cards in your bank cards, uh, and GPG cards, and in various other uh, you know, cryptographic cards. Um, because these cards are able to easily perform a variety of cryptographic operations. Uh, so here's an example of a Visa debit card uh, that, as mentioned, is uh, running Java card. Uh, in this case, it's running Java card version 2.2. Uh, and on it, it is running the Visa card manager. Uh, however, other smart cards are more purpose-built. Uh, so, for example, things like a door key don't need a full Java virtual machine. And in fact, you may want to spend that processing power on other more useful things. You might want to get more storage capacity out of it, for example. Uh, okay, so with that in mind, uh, how do we actually speak with a smart card? How do we get it to do something? You know, as previously mentioned, you don't just read a smart card. You have to talk with it. Uh, so, you know, what's the process for doing that? Uh, when you first insert a smart card into a reader, uh, you send it a reset command, uh, which asks the smart card to power on and to initialize its, its basic memory state. Uh, after this, the card responds with a answer to reset. Uh, and basically this defines things like uh, the rate at which the smart card should reply to commands, uh, the protocol version, transmission speed, any error correction settings, you know, basic communication parameters. Uh, and here's an example of what that might look like. Uh, and specifically, here's an analysis of what all those different hex characters mean. So, you know, this defines, as I mentioned, the, the protocol and the transmission rate that are used. Uh, the other kind of fun thing about answer to resets is that they, because they have all these different parameters and can vary uh, slightly between uh, different cards and devices, is that you can also use these to identify what kind of a card you're talking with. Uh, so in this case, this is the answer to reset for a uh, United Kingdom biometric residence permit. Uh, but here are other examples of other common answer to resets uh, for you know a handful of other cards that you might run into in the wild. So after you receive an answer to reset, uh, you'll want to select an application on the card. Uh, further, this is where the answer to reset might be helpful in that it allows you to determine what applications might be available on the card uh, just before even trying to select one. The card then says, okay, cool, that application's loaded, you're ready to go. Uh, and this sounds great, this sounds really easy, pretty simple, pretty standard, uh, you know, except not really, uh, because, you know, although you have this, this wonderful flow, uh, some cards are kind of rude and don't answer to your resets. Uh, so some cards will do this as a form of obfuscation, uh, things like laundry cards, electricity cards, and that if they don't answer to your reset, then you won't know how to speak with them. So it, it's secure. Um, and so when you, you know, try to do it, you don't get a reply and you, you know, you don't know how to proceed. But, you know, fine, whatever. Let, let's assume that you did get an answer to reset or that you somehow otherwise know uh, the transmission rate and the protocol and all of that. Uh, so then how you proceed after selecting the application is completely up to the application. Um, applications usually implement a handful of standard commands. Uh, here are a couple examples of them. Uh, and these commands are defined by a specification called the global platform. Uh, and the idea behind global platform is so that smart cards are able to interoperate with each other and to enable smart cards to host multiple applications. Uh, so you could, you know, in theory, 
have a card that acts both as a SIM card and as a bank card uh, because of these interop uh, standards. Uh, however, it's totally cool to ignore these, um, which means that speaking with a random card is an absolute headache uh, because you need to know what, what subset of these commands it supports, what custom commands it supports, and how it would like these commands to be sent to it. But, you know, further on, uh, let's assume that you do know what commands the card supports. You know, let's say that it's it's a standard that you're aware of or that you sniffed the communication going on, uh, you know, while the card was being legitimately used. And as a simple example of, you know, well-known uh, smart card specification, uh, let's look at GSM authentication. Uh, now, GSM is a particularly good example of where a smart card can be useful uh, because your cell phone provider uh, wants to be able to securely authenticate you but doesn't necessarily trust your handset. However, it does trust the SIM card that it issued to you. So when you first connect to a GSM network, the cell tower um, sends a random string announce uh, to your cell phone. Um, and at the same time, uh, the cell tower is aware of a KI, uh, which is an encryption key associated with your SIM card. Now, uh, to make this a bit more interesting, let's assume that your SIM card also has a pin on it. So your SIM card is also aware of this KI, and it also has a counter in it of how many times uh, you're allowed to try uh, pin entry. So you tell the uh, SIM card, you know, uh, my pin is one, two, three, four. The SIM card says, no, that's actually not the correct pin. It decreases uh, this counter. Uh, then, you know, try a different pin and it says, yes, that's fine. Great. Uh, at which point, you know, the, the SIM card has now authenticated you as in an okay state to proceed and to act on your behalf. Uh, so then the phone will ask the SIM card to sign this random string and using uh, this KI, it will perform onboard uh, crypto and return a the signed nonce, uh, which the phone can then uh, send back to the cell tower and demonstrate that you do indeed possess uh, the SIM card. And in this example, the SIM card is demonstrating two access control methods. Uh, it protects both the PIN and the KI. Um, because the SIM card performs cryptographic operations on board, uh, the KI isn't exposed at all. Um, so it's not like when you enter your PIN, uh, the phone is now able to read the KI. Um, and so this, this keeps it secure uh, unless you're able to brute force uh, the KI. Um, so one attack uh, that you could perform would be to ask the SIM card to sign uh, multiple of these uh, nonces, and eventually, because of a weakness in the algorithm that was previously used in older SIM cards, you could then use this to determine uh, what the KI was. Uh, this isn't a problem in newer SIM cards, uh, but it used to be more of an issue in more developing nations that would use these older SIM cards uh, for cost reasons. Now, we also have smart cards in our bank cards. Uh, which is defined by a different protocol called EMV. Um, and the idea behind this protocol is to provide a secure environment in a assumed hostile environment. Uh, same thing as uh, with a cell phone. Uh, you don't necessarily trust uh, the handset, just like with a payments environment, you don't necessarily trust the payments terminal. Um, Additionally, the other fun thing is that you can have multiple applications, you know, on one payments card. Uh, this is more commonly used in the United States and in uh, continental Europe to do things uh, like debit cards that support uh, multiple payment networks. Uh, however, you can also use smart cards uh, for more generic data storage. Uh, so you can use them for door cards, student cards, uh, so on and so forth, where you're not really asking the card to perform any cryptographic operations on your behalf, and instead you're just asking it to prove uh, that, that you possess that card. Now, uh, quite a few of these cards are uh, belong to a series called MyFair Ultralight. Uh, these aren't, the MyFair series of cards generally aren't 
uh, Java cards, and instead they're custom ASICs um, purely for this sort of data storage um, uh, use case. Um, and my Thera Ultralight cards are mostly publicly readable um, and have very basic access control settings. Uh, these cards t are pretty popular uh, with disposable or single-use tickets. Uh, so above is a Dutch uh, single-use uh, rail ticket and below is a Glasgow subway single-use ticket. Uh, and both of these are cardboard cards uh, that do actually have uh, contactless smart cards in them. Uh, and here is an example of the data held on them. Uh, to the left is the Dutch rail card, to the right is the Glasgow subway card. Um, and as you can see there's not a whole lot of storage space on here. Um, there's also no you know immediately humanly readable data on here. You have to use uh, you know binary data um, in order to keep things you know down uh, to a, a reasonable uh, size. Uh, however, more permanent cards are uh, my fair classic cards, and so you'll you'll see these in actual uh, plastic cards, uh, things like student cards or transit cards. Uh, and with these, you just read sectors off the card. Uh, you there's also some uh, you know cryptographic operations that go on in order to ensure that you are actually allowed to read uh, the different sectors on the card or whether you're allowed to modify them. Um, the way that most door cards uh, that use MyFair Classic work is they simply read uh, this sector zero, uh, which contains a, a serial number which is written into the card at the factory and is hardware locked and can't be modified. Uh, so in theory, you can't just go and buy a blank MyFair Classic card and change the UID on it. Uh, however, you can buy uh, these changeable UID MyFair cards uh, from shady websites, um, you know, in China. Um, now the cool thing is some people store data on these cards, uh, but you know, as I mentioned, this this is in theory safe because you need the encryption keys to read and write data uh, from these cards. Uh, and in theory, the card has the ability to say, no, I'm not going to let you read that. You don't have the right encryption key for it. Um, however, these cards have been demonstrated to have pretty broken crypto, uh, and these exploits have been known for a while. Um, and this is to the point where NXP, the manufacturer of these cards, have said that these cards are unsafe to use, uh, anymore, uh, and any usage of them should be discontinued. Uh, because you can go and just dump any card uh, that uses my Fair Classic. So here's an example of my Santa Domingo Subway uh, card, and I have the read keys as well as the write keys. So if I wanted to, I could totally just change my card balance. Um, the Fun thing is that although these are known to be very vulnerable, uh, they're still pretty commonly deployed. Uh, the first Oyster cards uh, were MyFair Classic. Uh, the Scottish National Entitlement cards are in MyFair Classic. Um, and it's pretty common to use these in student cards as well, just because they're fairly low cost uh, and they're pretty easy to deploy and that they're very simple cards. But, you know, of course, uh, not everybody uses MyFair Classic. Some people actually listen when the manufacturer says, hey, stop giving us money for these cards, they're unsafe. Um, so instead, NXP says that you should use MyFair Desfire instead. Uh, and this is what modern Oyster cards use. Uh, this is what most modern transit cards will use as well. Uh, and Desfire uses an entirely new protocol. It uses uh, stronger cryptographic algorithms. Um, additionally, it cleanly supports multiple applications and has a much stronger access control system. Instead of just interacting with raw sectors on the card as you do with MyFair Classic, uh, you allow the Desfire card to manage the data sectors for you and handle them on a per application basis. Uh, the other fun thing with this is that because of the access control system, uh, the card issuer can say that it wants certain aspects of the card to be publicly readable. Uh, so here's an example of an Android application that takes advantage of this to read a handful of publicly available transit cards. 
In this case, it's reading a San Francisco Clipper card and is showing a few of the uh, most recent trips taken using the card. Uh, unfortunately, Transport for London doesn't allow you to inspect an Oyster card. Um, but, you know, th this is something that, that's fully up to the card issuer uh, to decide on. Uh, unfortunately, there's a way to break into these the older versions of these cards uh, through a side channel attack. Uh, you can measure the electromagnetic uh, in interference that's created by the card while it's carrying out cryptographic operations, and you can use that to determine uh, its secret keys. Uh, this isn't exploitable in newer versions of Deskfire cards, and so hopefully this shouldn't be an issue, but you know, as is the case with MyFair Classics and with older SIM cards, you know, there are still uh, operators that choose to issue these cards knowing that they're vulnerable simply because they're cheaper. Uh, additionally, in the United Kingdom, we have a fun transit card system called ITSO. Uh, if you have a concessionary travel pass, uh, or if you live in a city that is not London and have a smart card that you use to travel on, uh, it will probably have this logo somewhere on it. Uh, now, the specification supports uh, using uh, MyFair Classic, although uh, you're not supposed to use that for newer deployments anymore. Uh, and instead you're supposed to use MyFair Deskfire. Uh, and ITSO is kind of a double whammy for smart cards. Uh, inside every ticket barrier, uh, ticket vending machine, and uh, ticket inspection device, uh, you have one of these cards. Uh, and the, this, this card is a, a secure application module uh, which contains a private key uh, defined by ITSO uh, which can be used to cryptographically verify the contents of any uh, given card. Uh, so this is used by ticket barriers and uh, ticket inspection devices to make sure that your tickets, balance, you know, so on and so forth are uh, valid. And essentially, uh, the, <clears throat> the way that this works is your reader uh, speaks with uh, your card, uh, reads, you know, the products that you have on the card uh, from it, and these are signed uh, using this, uh, the SAM uh, card, and you're able to securely uh, verify that. Uh, additionally, there's uh, another popular uh, transit card protocol called uh, Calypso that is used in Belgium, Germany, uh, France, and Portugal, uh, which is more interesting uh, smart card use case in that uh, instead of the smart card simply storing your ticket data and the ticket barrier is responsible for validating whether you're allowed through, uh, the smart card is instead trusted and is in charge of uh, determining whether you're allowed to conduct a journey or not. Uh, and so in this regard, the smart card is slightly smarter uh, than just an ITSO card. Uh, however, of course, there are other applications that smart cards are used for, uh, like passports. Uh, and passports are fun because you have sensitive data on them that has to be protected. Uh, with some countries' passports, you have fingerprint information. Uh, on all countries' passports, you have biometric information. You have the information on the cover page. Uh, and so it would be kind of terrible if you just had a passport in your bag and someone was able to read it. Uh, and in order to protect against this, uh, there's a authentication scheme called basic access control uh, where when you read information from a passport you have to supply uh, the holder's birthday, the passport number, and the passport's expiration date. Uh, and this is why you, when a passport is scanned at the airport, uh, you still have to scan these two lines at the bottom. Uh, it's because that's where this information is contained. So after extracting that information, uh, you can send it to the passport, uh, who will then generate session keys for you, and you can use these session keys to securely read uh, the holder's photo, you know, the information on the card, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, additionally, for more sensitive information, such as fingerprints, uh, you have extended access control, um, which requires that a actual certificate be presented to the passport before it's able to give up data. 
Uh, and in this sense, merely possessing the identity document isn't enough to get that information. You also have to be trusted uh, by the issuer of the document. Now, the information that's used for basic access control is all numeric data. You know, your birthday, document number, expiration date, which we can brute force. Uh, and there is a pretty interesting paper on this, uh, which used a webcam to see the cover of the exterior cover of the passport uh, to determine which country issued it. And by with this information, you can determine certain patterns uh, about passports. Uh, so, for example, uh, newer American passports uh, tend to start their passport numbers at fifty thousand. So, you know, you can already eliminate a bunch of iterations with that information. Uh, additionally, you could inspect things like the wear and tear on the passport to figure out, you know, to kind of guess uh, how soon it's going to expire. Uh, now, some countries are a bit clever about this. Uh, American passports include a Faraday cage on their uh, cover. Uh, so unless you have the passport open, uh, you're unable to speak with the NFC coil, uh, the NFC chip inside of the passport. Um, however, you know, this is still a problem with, with other countries which don't uh, sh have shields in their passport covers. Right. So, basically, uh, it's pretty impractical to attack the smart card itself uh, because of the physical security elements involved, because of risk of damage. Um, and because, you know, even if you do manage to directly read the data off the EEPROM on the smart card, you still have to figure out how to interpret that data um, because you no longer have the operating system on your side to help you out there. Uh, instead, most attacks on smart cards uh, rely on broken cryptographic operations or they rely on side channel leaks. Uh, smart cards run very, very small and heavily optimized applications. Uh, this is, you know, they, kind of interestingly enough, you know, these cards were invented in the 70s. Um, and, you know, since then, they haven't changed a whole lot. Uh, so you only have a couple K of, of uh, you know, uh, persistent storage. Uh, you only have a handful of megahertz of processing speed. Uh, and additionally, you know, the, they're very low power devices as well especially when you consider contactless cards, which are powered, you know, just from the induction field. Uh, because of this, you know, the very limited scope of the operating systems on these cards, you're kind of unlikely to find things like buffer overflow attacks, just because you, know, you don't really have the space to have that much code on these cards. Um, but because they've been around for so long, there's a lot of software that allows you to interact with known smart cards. Um, so Card Peak is one of my favorite applications for doing this. Uh, it runs on Windows, Linux, uh, Mac OS, uh, and it allows you to read both contactless and contact cards uh, should you have you know, the appropriate readers for your computer. Uh, NXP Tag Info is an Android application uh, that allows you to read NFC cards on an Android phone that supports them. Uh, it's also quite cool in that it will attempt to interpret the contents of the card if it is able to. Um, and there's also the eSEBS uh, smart Ticket Checker, which allows you to read the contents of an ITSO card, uh, which is also an Android application. Uh, so if you have one of these uh, UK Transit cards, you can see what information is held on them. Uh, but the fun doesn't stop there, uh, because you can also build your own smart cards. Uh, there's a very interesting talk at DEF CON 21 uh, about these two guys who uh, built a custom GSM network at uh, TorCamp, and they allowed people to write their own applications to live on SIM cards that they issued at the camp. Uh, so they have on uh, this GitHub page a bunch of documentation on the Java card SDK, uh, how you go about uh, loading applications onto smart cards, how to test it, you know, all that fun stuff. Uh, and the thing to hopefully get out of this is that we have tiny computers in all of our pockets. You know, we have them in our appliances. Uh, they're just absolutely everywhere. And if you say hello to them, perhaps they'll say hi back. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Okay.
Okay, so any questions, anybody? Is there a, any online tutorials that you've, you've made for this sort of thing? Or uh, the question is, are there any online tutorials? So there are quite a few uh, online resources um, regarding the how to read information on smart cards. Um, the programs that I mentioned do, um, for example, CardPeak is fully open source, um, and so then you, you can go through the source code of that, see which commands it's sending, um, and get a better understanding of how it's speaking with the cards. Um, there are also a handful of uh, other websites that go into that with more detail uh, that I'll put on that uh, URL. It's not up right now because SSH is blocked on this network, I forgot. Uh, so hopefully later this evening I'll put that up for you. Anybody else? Yeah? Uh, you mentioned the ITSO cards don't actually store the balance on the card, right? Uh, they can. Uh, so, for example, uh, the Glasgow subway cards um, do store a balance on them, um, and you, when you go through a ticket barrier, it goes through and it validates, you know, that all your top ups were legitimately signed, and then it, you know, deducts the balance. Um, but in theory, uh, because of that signature, you can't modify your balance yourself. Uh, whether that's actually the case or not, I leave open to interpretation. <laughs> <laughs> yep. um, considering the Heathrow article recently and breach, how easy is it to clone cards? The the what article? Sorry. Uh, Heathrow Airport. Uh, I'm 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 not aware of what uh, happened at, at Heathrow. Uh, uh, so two employees basically they cloned their physical access badge. Mm -hmm. How easy is it to do? Uh, so depending on the card type, it can be reasonably easy to do. Uh, if it was a MyFair Classic card, uh, as I mentioned, you can buy uh, completely reprogrammable uh, MyFair cards. Um, and so you can just uh, use off-the-shelf hardware, uh, you know, just a, a boring MyFair um, writer uh, to, or sorry, an NFC uh, like dongle uh, to read the data off the original card. Uh, break the encryption keys and then write it onto the new card. Uh, because MyFair Classic is just data, um, there's no application or anything like that that you need to clone. You just need to copy the data over. Um, but it, it could it's more difficult for other cards like Deskfire and such. Anybody else? No? Mikey drunkenly told me that he had a question for me last yeah, night. I was so. just about to say that. I was just going to speaking about this, but what is your opinion of um, Apple's little ghetto two-man rule smart card thing for the new um, cloud vault? Uh, so the idea with that is Apple, uh, for their iCloud encryption, uh, use smart cards in order to store uh, the encryption keys that are used you know, to, to secure user data. Um, and uh, effectively, if you think about it, uh, smart cards are just very cheap uh, hardware security modules. Uh, you can use them to store private key data, uh, you can use them to perform cryptographic operations on your behalf, and they will not expose the private key data unless they're programmed to do so. Um, additionally, one thing that's sort of interesting that Apple does is once they finish using a card, they throw it into a shredder. Um, which is you know, potentially overkill um, because the idea with a smart card is that um, if you, you know, have too many invalid pen entries or, or something like that, it will block itself and refuse to do anything. But you know, I suppose there's no harm in shredding it. Um, anything else? Okay, well, um, I'd like to just give Henry a <laughs> Thank you.